Well, may I uh, say thank you to everybody for uh, inviting me here, the organisers, and I hope I can say something that's useful to the people in the audience. Uh, I appreciate I'm from a, quite a different background, but my heart is in the same place as yours is, I think. So let's see um, if I can sort of give some justification. I have a Raspberry Pi here, which I will turn on at the end with any luck, but, uh, and so I'm luckier than many people, I suppose, given the uh, uh, success disaster we've had with it. So but let's have a look at the talk with this first. Um, Oh, thank you. So the first thing I want to do, oh, I've given a set of slides here, by the way, which are going to be useful for reading afterwards, and I'll put them up on the web. Uh, that means that occasionally people will read ahead of what I'm going to say. I don't particularly care. The aim is so you can take them and give them to your friends or what. So this shows how unrepresentative I am. So I'm going to say what's gone wrong with school-age computing by looking at a sample of 18-year-old applicants for computer science BA at Cambridge. Now, you might say, that's really silly, because we all know know that computing's bigger than that, and I'm going to agree with you, but I'm going to start with that issue. And the, the, the thing that's gone wrong as far as we're concerned is we have, an under, we have a prospective student there, we interview them, we start by saying, oh, what have you done? Get them all warmed up, solve a few problems. Now tell us about the most interesting program you've written. And the answer here, in 1990, they said, oh, well, I've had a BBC Micro. I had that since I was seven or something. My parents bought me one cheaply, and I've written this and this or something. Uh, nowadays, uh, too, all too often, they say, well, I've written a web page, and I've used a package to do whatever, whatever. Occasionally, they'll say they linked it together with Visual Basic or something, but in a sense, this has gone backwards, and it's not just the fact that knowledge has gone backwards. No, you might say people know a great deal more. They do in certain ways, but this very technical way that... Um, I'll come to in a second, is something we've gone backwards a little in. And let me say, we don't get as many applicants as we'd like for our course. Uh, for example, Cambridge uh, has a course suitable for 100 people, and in much of the last 10 years, we've only been taking 70 or 80 onto that, just because there weren't enough people applying. Uh, I'll be happy to say that, well, I'm happy to say that we actually have 104 offers for our 100 places for next year, so things are beginning to look up. But the critical thing is we get moaned at by the companies in the area saying, why can't you produce enough graduates? And we have high employment rates. Now, it is true before... What happens is schools will tell, still tell us that, ah, oh, well, you get a computer science degree, uh, then you earn a low average salary and lots of people are out of work. And I don't know where they get the figures from, but sometimes it's because they conflate computer science with pulling cables on the floors. And sometimes uh, there are some degrees that do seem to have low employment rates, and I'm not going to speculate further on that. But certainly for the main universities, the employment rates are high. Notice I've italicized computer science there. Um, right, so what's gone wrong? We all know the basic one. Uh, reason one is the bete noire, which is ICT key skills. Uh, and as I say, that's the, <laughs> that's the new name for what was called typing when I was at school. I will even say something less politically correct, because I was at school a long time ago before there wasn't p political correctness. And typing was taught to rather underability teenage girls, while the underage ability teenage boys were taught woodwork and metalwork. Uh, I learned woodwork and metalwork too, so that's all right. Uh, but I didn't learn typing. Uh, there was the focus on presentation. And now, if you want to joke, this is very new labor, isn't it? It doesn't matter what it does, so long as it looks good. Uh, the bright kids knew it already. Uh, I don't want to make this political. Gove and Schmidt said it's not fit for purpose. And the Royal Society Review, which is worth looking at if you haven't seen it, said ICT is a word which should be avoided and we should focus on the three separate overlapping aims. One is digital literacy, using tools that involve windows and mice and things like that, highlighting, drawing slides, uh, making the slides go thump when I change, or having overlays, which I haven't done because I'm too lazy, apologize. Uh, 
versus computer science, which is something that we want to encourage, but, well, I'll say in a minute, we don't want to throw out babies and bathwaters, uh, versus IT. IT is important. We don't want to, uh, building, well, we're not awfully good at it. Um, for example, if I want uh, NHS computerization, that's a big IT project. Um, and uh, so uh, there are these three separate things. Um, now, the question is that we've got a lot of people out here who are teachers, and they've tried their best with the prescribed syllabus with some sort of heroes sort of saying, well, teachers see us on the side. And I suspect a lot of the people who've come today are those people. But let's just forget that there is a delicate issue from the fact that sometimes the ICT, there are real personal management and government issues here that people say we got... In this audience, we're probably quite keen on saying, let's flip to this new way of doing things. But sometimes the ICT teacher was appointed because they edited the school glossy, for example. Uh, and saying that just by government or school management saying somebody on the chalk face has suddenly got to be able to be good at teaching algorithms, for example, uh, maybe they can do it on their summer holiday instead of having a break. After all, teachers... Have, no, I'm not even going there. Sorry, not in this audience. Uh, but I'm saying that there is an issue here. You can't just fix things by waving wands. And we do have to think about where the training is coming from. And again, I applaud what Andrew through, you know, Google doing the ambassadors, but on the other hand, as he pointed out, they only a drop in the water. We have to solve this in the real world. The other one, what's gone wrong with school-aged and computing, is overpackaged and fragile hardware and software both raises the activation energy for doing something. So suppose I've got one of these things, then I can break it and nobody gets upset. Look at, look at some scenarios. If you're a poor family, you don't have a computer. If you're in the, uh, there's one computer in the household, and you say, I'd like to install Linux on that. Suddenly the family's photograph, well, first you get, you're not getting, taking the back off my computer, or the second one in red, you've, uh, Linux has lost all my photos. Oh, I'll get them back. No, you won't. We're taking it to a professional. Uh, richer families, they buy their kids a MacBook Air. Lovely computers. Well, uh, this isn't a MacBook Air, but it's something very expensive. It's just what your rich auntie buys you, and you give it to the kid, and they want to sort of know how it works, and you can't even find out where the screws are, and if you can, then they don't fit any screwdriver you've got. So you force the back off, and the parents are horrified because it costs a thousand pounds. Or indeed at schools, how clever of that little XXX causing all the computers in the school computer room to display their name in gold letters. What they do, they don't tell you you're a hero, they summon in your parents and tell them how much it's going to cost to tell them to put it back again. Um, software again, it's so complicated that I can't see how to start doing anything. You get Windows. How do you do something? You have to start by downloading something. Uh, maybe your school locks it out, maybe the school has allowed it. Uh, maybe it's got the wrong word in the name that makes the triggers. Uh, and just getting to somewhere you can do anything. Now, I know we've seen games aims for that with Scratch and things like that, and Python, but it's a question of enabling children to get to those areas. Uh, and again, one thing I want to be aware of is the word computer programming. Uh, in the UK and Europe, North America, it's not necessarily that came in the Asian nations because they were developing. Programming goes in and out of fashion. 1960s, for those of us older, remember, my, you, know, your, my, you know, my cousin was, uh, got a job with a gas board and they became a programmer. And it pays really good money, programmers. And then it sort of dipped out. The late 80s, we all got hardware and uh, we all got uh, micros. And, the BBC had lessons on programming. Government said everybody should be a programmer. Then it sort of fades again. And now we're saying everybody should program. Th these have been very transitory things at the moment. And it's important not to repeat the boom and bust. So we have to avoid saying everybody must be a programmer. I'll come back to that in a second. But th so the separation into digital literacy, using tools for whether I work... Uh, giving a lecture like this, or whether I work in a petrol station, clicking on, give them a, a, Vivi, a Avios points when they bought their petrol, uses the same mentality, you know, booking cars in to be serviced. 
but it's, uh, computer science is great. And it's very easy for me, and I'll come back to that as well, to say, oh, everybody should do computer science, but I'm not representative. Probably most of us aren't. It's important to realize that these are just parts of a spectrum like children's talents. Uh, here's programming. Here's a couple of slogans. Dictionary gives two definitions of programming. One is the most fun you can have with your clothes on. And the other one uh, uh, subscribed, many other people subscribe to programming. A pastime similar to ballet, banging one's head against a wall with fewer opportunities for reward. <laughs> oh, come on. But, you know, this is a real problem when we have people. Some people love it and say, why aren't you following it? And some people just don't get their head around it. But that isn't to say we should drive them away because there's still this idea of computational thinking. And go away and look at Wing's article, look up Wing on the YouTube. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant to put the uh, YouTube address on. There's a YouTube video of uh, Jeanette Wing talking about computational thinking. It's aimed at undergraduates, well, there's, uh, it's aimed at a 18 year, uh, 16 to 20 age group anyway, but there's a nice video on that. So what she was saying is computational thinking is as fundamental as reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, and she also says it's incestuous. The more you can think of a problem computationally, the more that it helps you to use computers and understand them and understand more for the good of society what computers can do. But, uh, doing, but playing with computers also enables you to think in more computational ways. And one thing I've used repeatedly is how do you sort a pack of playing cards, right? Well, you just sort them, come on, you. Yeah, but how do you do it? Well, all right, let's put some numbers on and let's sort them. Well, you sort of, yeah, well, you sort them. Uh, um, um, maybe there's a foolish one that says, well, you type the numbers into uh, uh, Excel and you click on the data column and the sort column because you don't need to do any of that yourself now and the numbers just come out sorted. Uh, but the trouble is that's exactly the thing of throwing away the scaffolding that enable it's like saying nobody needs to do arithmetic because we have calculators. You need to know how to do arithmetic even if you use tools to help. So the answer is an, a, a, an algorithm. And I wrote a couple of lectures on introduction to algorithms for 18 year olds on that uh, slide there for the, well, for the Sutton Trust. Uh, we give some lectures for Sutton Trust on introducing elementary algorithms, and there's a couple of nice ones on sorting there. I don't want to go from that at the moment. Okay, so the answer is, come on, you're from Cambridge. You don't know anything about the real world. Um, well, uh, I, you do get that sometimes. We, we're at one extreme, and uh, so I'm at one extreme, both in the university sector towards one end, and also at the age group that you people represent, I'm also at the other extreme. But we all suffer from those, the same forces. And the key thing for a society, it's important to get people of all abilities interested in doing... Uh, in interest in some computational thinking. Computational thinking, sorry, I've maybe not said as much about that, is the ability just when you have a problem to debug it. When something's not working, you check all the things in the way rather than saying, it's not working, we'd better call an engineer. Uh, and that's the sort of packaged approach to everything. And so let's get people interested. We'd like to get children interested in computing. And we'd like to do it by doing fun things, not just academic things, which is where, of course, I applaud the Google effort we've seen. And again, the, uh, the efforts with the talk like this morning on uh, the Arduino, where people were programming bits of uh, hardware. So when you put your hand over a photo cell, it moved a wiper across the other side of a table. So, uh, and you know, you, not just proper academic things. So something that says, you write a filter for the website that when you look at it on your computer, when you're logged on, it shows the headmaster's name in rather more disparaging text than it does the, uh, your own heroic name. Uh, you know, things like that. P children like doing seditious things, doing games programs. Nobody wants to do something boring, but uh, uh, if it's coded as a game, then that's fine. And again, I can't say much more about this. We want to schools to initiate this sort of school thinking, uh, computational thinking, sorry, so to say computational, and 
opportunities for all pupils. And now you might say, yes, but surely you want the people at one end. Yes, we do, but it's in the interest of UK PLC to have everybody with a higher uh, status here. What we hear a lot from our local industry is the lot of the Cambridge area is, re is recycling people who uh, the jobs have gone away from earlier and the industry is slowly becoming older because we're not producing enough graduates and, uh, and occasionally, well, quite often we recruit people from abroad because we're not getting the local skills. Anyway, enough of that. Let's. The next thing I want to talk about is something called spiral development. One way of designing software is you sort of go and write it all and you hand it over and say, this is uh, a new operating system from a big company, isn't it wonderful? Uh, and the community then comments. Uh, but there's often a way of developing something, especially when the user doesn't know what they want, which is called the, the spiral development uh, method. You start by building a toy system and somebody says, ah, oh, but I'd like that to be a little different. And then you build that a little different. And then you go round and round again, building more and more refined components until you make a final system. And there's always a danger of overdeveloping one component prematurely. But this is also applies to teaching, I'm going to say. So we must teach principles over idea. And we don't want to do uh, the... <laughs> We don't want to teach the half dozen ways of drawing boxes around things in Microsoft Word, uh, which uh, there's a real story behind that. But uh, what we want to do is to enable people not to know the many different ways in pick your favorite language, Python, whatever, of doing something. It's the big picture we'd like to see. So uh, similarly, we wouldn't like necessarily somebody to say, oh, these are the wonderful ways of which a modern Intel processor works. It might be interesting for very star pupils, but maybe we just need, um, and we might do this at the end of degree level, but we wouldn't mind people, like I heard another talk today, understanding a computer is just something that goes off to memory, gets an instruction, does it, and goes back to memory for the next one, for example. So, and choosing that is actually important too. Let me now look, uh, I want to change topic now and look at the Raspberry Pi. So as I said, here's where I held one up. Let's actually, I'm sorry for those of you who know this backwards. Uh, this is what we've got. We've got a, a box here with uh, the, the little computer in there is this thing in the middle with the Broadcom sign on it. Uh, it's about a centimeter square. And actually, that's the just 256 megabytes of RAM. Underneath the RAM, soldered neatly underneath, is the CPU and GPU, which is about half the area. But, so this is something that has the capabilities of a graphics card that would have cost you hundreds of pounds five or seven years ago. Uh, and we'll see that in a while. There's, uh, so, most of this, uh, so this is the clever bits of it. And then most of the rest of it is just connectors for power, this SD card, which is the new version of the floppy disk, stick your camera, uh, memory card in, uh, the video output, the internet, the USB for your keyboard and mouse, and other things, and a few LEDs to flash. And there's a photo of it uh, on the slide, or you can get that off the website, so, uh, and the nice little logo. So let me now... Let me now be disparaging, because we've had a lot of hype saying how wonderful the uh, Raspberry Pi is. Let me first be rude about it. It's just a slightly underpowered computer without a screen, and indeed without a keyboard or a, a, a mouse or anything else. And anything you could do on it, you could do on a laptop. True, true, true. We're a fraud, right? Uh, but it's got some things which is it's cheap. It doesn't, if I take this laptop and I install something on it and it trashes the hard disk, then Andrew is going to be a little upset. Uh, if I do something and trash the memory on this, then I take out the, uh, the only writable bit on this is the card that sits in here, the camera card, the SD card, and I can take that in and anything I put back on that uh, is complete the system. So you can't wreck it. And the other thing is not that it does anything new of itself, but it changes mindsets. Oh, but if I had one of these, then I could put it in a weather balloon. You know, you don't send your Apple Mac up in a weather balloon because it might get broken or lost or something. 
Uh, there's also physical pins out here uh, with GPIO, which is not as convenient, I first to admit, than the Arduino. Uh, but uh, uh, it's a it gives you access to this. You know, if you're a modern railway, uh, a model railway person, you could indeed control your train set with that. Uh, so Arduino has similar aims, but the, the main difference, I think, is this is higher up the food train. The Arduino is for more embedded things. This runs Linux and so looks like an ordinary desktop in a uh, minor platform. So let me do a bit of, uh, now a bit of computer science for, uh, or history. Here's what's called Moore's Law, and going along here is the, what I've done is dots for release chips as something if I can read any of those. That one says 386, that one says 486, that one says Pentium. So across here is the date they were introduced, and up here is the number of transistors they've given. And notice that's a logarithmic scale. Every, so what happens is that this is Moore's Law from Wikipedia. The number of transistors empirically doubles on the integrated circuit every two years. Uh, wow. Uh, why is that happening? Well, to some extent, it's self-fulfilling. Once the people notice there was this law, they start by designing, saying, well, we can repeat it, so it just happens to continue. So you can have something twice as powerful every two years. And so we saw this about 10 or 15 years ago. One year it was a 1.2 megahertz Pentium, next year 1.5, next, well, not next six months, 1.8. And now we hit three gigahertz when everybody stopped. And now one year you buy one core processors, two years later you buy two core, two years later you go four core, two years later you buy eight core. So all of these are doing more for the same amount of money. And on those devices, it was a two centimeter square chip. So what the Raspberry Pi has done is you can say, take a 2000 state of five state of the art graphics card and a 700 megahertz card, which is not exactly state of the art, but you can halve the cost of it every two years. Well, half the size and probably the cost for a very small number of dollars. I can't tell you how much this chip costs, but you might imagine if you can sell the whole computer for $35, the chip, and including all these expensive plugs, then the chip isn't costing you very much. Um, uh, and so let's go back and have a look uh, for the idea of $25 com uh, dollar computers. And this is a bit of history about the... Uh, right, so the BBC computer cost a lot more than that, but it did rely on the existing television. And the answer is everybody's got a spare TV or a monitor around the house. Uh, so Eben Upton at Cambridge, you know, this is the time we were all moaning how thick applicants had got. Well, we didn't quite put it like that. Uh, because they were just as bright, but they didn't do anything interesting anymore. Um, he realized he could make a computer with an Atmel chip for about $25 using an external keyboard and display. And this was a mark of heroism on Eben because the computer could just do the pixel rate on a television. And it could only do real computing when it was uh, cranking back from the bottom of the screen to the top of the screen. Uh, and it was a bit geeky, and you had to program it really at machine code level. But Moore's cause, laws caught up. And now we can just repeat the process with an ARM with a graphics card on it and put Linux. And so now what we say is this roughly is an industry standard computing platform at the same price. Uh, and so you can link these together. And when you link BBCs together, you had to design a special protocol. Well, as I can just take 10 of these, plug them into a network card, and just route them all together. So I can have a, uh, you might say, ah, oh, that's only a 25, uh, that's only a 700 megahertz arm. Yes, but I can buy 10 of them, put them together in a router, make them communicate, and that's the equivalent, if you believe, well, it's the naive equivalent of a 7,000 megahertz arm. Um, in other words, a 7 gigahertz arm. Oh, that's not too bad. So let's just observe that doing things cheaply and replicating can also be useful. Now, remember, now who on earth would be so stupid as to make a chip like that for us? Uh, remember fabbing a chip, that means taking the design of one of those and turning it into physical reality. Costs you about $10 million to buy the chipset, the mask. In order to make these chipsets, you, um, you basically build a mask which shows how the components are laid out. You shoot x-rays or ultraviolet through them, and that etches the underlying circuit. And uh, 
eventually, and you do magic with silicon and hydrogen fluoride and lots of nasty chemicals, and eventually a chip drops out the other end. They're dirt cheap to make, but you have to pay 10 million to make the first one, uh, is roughly the story. Uh, so we couldn't have had this designed. But, but it turned out people are already making very similar chips. Uh, my iPhone has got a chip in that's very similar. My HDTV set-top box, which I expect to buy from Dixon's for about 30 quid, uh, has got a chip in that needs to do HDTV, high-definition television. Uh, it also needs a controller to put up the, an arm to put up the uh, electronic program guide. And it needs memory. Well, we've, it probably doesn't need very much, but we put the memory on top, as I said. Uh, and all we needed to do to run Linux, now it turns out that Linux doesn't run very nicely if you just have 256 meg of memory and the processor and the graphics card because um, you need virtual memory. And here I'm not quite sure of the story, but Up Upton happened to be working at Broadcom and two years later Broadcom's next design had virtual memory hardware in it. Uh, it was really very fortunate bit of uh, happening. Um, to be fair, Broadcom have been very su supportive uh, all along. Uh, Eben seems to do more work for Raspberry Pi than he does for Broadcom, and the management just smile at him, and uh, he's a very lucky man. Uh, commercial stuff. So maybe this is partly because instead of him saying, I want to work in Raspberry Pi in my afternoons, and I want you to pay me money, and th this company will give me lots of shares and uh, go away, right? Uh, can I have the afternoon to work for charity? Oh, yes. Can I work for afternoon to uh, set up a rival company? Go away. Uh, so we found it as a charity. We got lots of support. So this is one thing, and I know you know this in terms of community activity, but we got a lot of support from various uh, sources who'd have wanted shares if we were a company. And we'd gone into long negotiations about what shares they got and how many we would have and what the golden handcuffs were. It's synergistic with the university, so we don't get any trouble there. Uh, the other thing was we aggressively drove down the bomb, uh, which is bill of materials. But as Eben once said, you have to be very careful not to use the word bomb for bill of materials when you're at airports uh, for the Raspberry Pi hardware. And there was just enough profit in this to enable the big suppliers. We were lucky we got the big suppliers in, uh, Farnell and RS, to build and pay royalties. I'm not going to tell you exactly the amount, but you could imagine... Uh, ballpark figures. They wouldn't do it for 1%, we wouldn't let them do it for 25%, but somewhere in between is a nice figure that keeps everything happy. Uh, and in fact, it's rather strange to think that just a year ago we thought, oh well, we might sell 10 or 15,000 of these. We might even be able to package them up ourselves or use a small fulfillment company. And uh, what happens is when we put this out, then uh, the demand crashed, even commercial websites, which is slightly uh, concerning. So that's why I worry about the uh, Raspberry Pi hype. Lots of people say, oh, it's wonderful, it does this and this. Yes, but what does it do? Because, well, I'll say that in a minute. Uh, what we, where are we? So what now and where are we going? So this is the halfway point where I say what we've done and we, we've designed and we're delivering cheap hardware. That's what you get. There's a fashion rush to get one, and I want to be very wary that that is a fashion rush, just like there was a fashion rush to get uh, Stephen Hawking's book on the brief history of time that many people still have on their bookshelf and still haven't read. Uh, what happens next? The, well, the danger is that parents play for it a bit, and uh, it gets on, you know, they recreate their youth and put it away. Uh, and we're very lucky that doing this happened at the same time as uh, government and Google and Examboard have exemplified computer science. So it doesn't do computer science for us. I'm sure I could run boring ICT lessons on this as well, uh, but uh, it's, we need... Um, it, it does things, but we want to avoid this. Everybody must be a programmer. We want to need tools that give a friendly introduction to the programming ideas. The idea of a big problem is split down something that does this and something does this. And this is the idea of computational thinking. If you want a program to do this and this, you write two separate programs to do them and wire them together. You don't make a program that does something hugely complicated that happens to do the two of them. Uh, and that's called abstraction part of computational thinking. So the critical needs here are software, 
this, you know, with all our best efforts, and one of our PhD students, Alex Bradbury, as you know, has wasted a year, no, sorry, used a year of his PhD in uh, developing the software, and we're eternally grateful, and we found him another year's funding, so that should be all right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but he is really an unsung, unsung hero on this. But what we need is more software. We need teaching materials, and we need a sharing community. Again, the danger is with teaching materials, you go and everybody makes their own. And I'm happy to see this is part of the community. This is the core of people who are sharing. And we do need open source. And one question I get asked about this is how much this is open source. Well, Linux is open source. Yes, but what about the hardware? Well... It will be one day real soon, and it's not for our own personal enrichment because we're a charity. One thing we want to do at the moment is retain the trademark over the Raspberry Pi so that we don't get people making cheap clones of it that don't quite work or do something different. We plan to throw it open source soon, all the hardware design, but we just like to, like to keep that a little until we've got a million or so out there. So let's go on and have a look at... Uh, what software? Some things we like are Scratch for younger age groups, Python for older age groups, and I was asked this question by uh, the ICT teacher of Bottisham Village College recently, what languages, uh, why do people object to, uh, you know, many of their students, she said, like C and C++. Well, there's just too many ways to learn bad habits. Uh, it's like saying, the only tool you need in the world is a chainsaw. Uh, uh, and sure, I can, I, can write, I can probably carve those lovely mushrooms that you found on the edge of the road with a chainsaw. However, it's not necessarily sure you give every one to your 15-year-olds. Uh, Java's okay, but there's a big learning car curve centered around the Java mentality. You first design your class hierarchy. So these are languages, Scratch and Python, that give immediate uh, uh, feedback. And what user interface? Uh, and again, we felt this is a big tension. We still have the battles over this. Should we have a desktop tile WIMP? Uh, WIMP, for those of you who don't know, is Windows icon menus and pointer. It's sometimes rephrased as uh, Windows icons, what is it, mice and pull-down menus uh, as attractive. Uh, but remember the BBC Micro work really well is the command you start up, it goes Bing, immediately you've got the command line, you type something in, and it had a certain imme immediacy, or maybe I'm just getting old. Um, where have I got to at the moment? Yeah, so now I want to sort of say, this is something that you've, you know far more about than I do, and I'm sorry this now gets sketchy because I don't know things about it, right? So I can tell you what I do know. It's difficult to find and share teaching materials. Suppose as a teacher I go out there and say, I want to teach my students something about Scratch. So I type teaching materials Scratch and it says 1.5 million hats, hits. And I look around and some sites look plausible, some sites don't. Some are secretly trying to sell me drugs. Uh, uh, it's just, there's just too much fragmentation, and so we need to establish the communities that I, I see uh, lots of work going on in this one. We need repositories and advice, and you know, I'm not thinking that you guys need advice, but I'm saying there's a lot of schools that are out there that do need this advice, and how do they get it? They don't get it through osmosis because you guys are out there listening to me. Um, as I say, one school I was talking to recently, the... ICT teacher was very helpful, but had a degree in English and languages. And while technologically they, they knew what was happening, I had to say, I, well, we had a, a discussion of where computer science, uh, where we were looking to go from and what we might want from schools. STEMnet we've interacted with and found them very in, uh, useful. And um, many of you have been to Andrew Haig's session today, which I should have gone to, but managed to miss out on. Right. The final thing I want to say here before maybe, well, I've got one or two more things. I, I've got one or two bonus slides, but I just want to sort of try and wrap this up around here. Is students sharing their work, right? There was a real buzz in the 1980s when any teenage kid, uh, well, not anyone, but a fair number of them sat in their bedroom, maybe being slightly male autistic children, but actually suddenly telling their parents they'd earned a few thousand pounds legally. 
or maybe it was only a few hundred. Uh, you know, they wrote students, program computer games in the bedroom and sold them for pro profit. And money's really important because it gives kudos to what can be seen as a geeky activity. Uh, you know, you say, I go and play chess at the weekend. Oh dear, yawn. Oh, that must be an awfully boffing activity, right? Oh, yes, and I won 100 pounds this last weekend. Oh, wow, that's really neat. Um, and the question is, do we want to support this? And I think the answer is yes. But the question is, how do we do it? Do we establish websites? Or do we say money? we shouldn't have money involved? Um, and I'm, I don't know what the answer to that is, but do we establish websites, upload and download? Or, for example, suppose we said, oh, there should be an app store for the Raspberry Pi, just like the Apple one. And maybe even you can put your software you've written up for sale. Uh, from any price, from naught to whatever. And you can even say what percentage of that you'd like to donate to charity. And maybe that might encourage people to uh, return a little back to it as well. I'm only uh, speculating here, but I'm saying there is an issue on how do you enable people to share things. Um, and do we want money to get involved in this? Right, so what I'd like to do now, and I'm happy to answer questions. I'll try and do a demo, and I've also, yeah, so let's do the conference. So that's the sort of end of where I'd like to um, start in terms of the technical talk. I have one here that I'll plug in a few seconds, which means swapping the projector over. One other thing I have, if people are interested, is I put an abstract up there and a couple of additional slides on algorithms, which I can uh, display if, or people talk about afterwards, or they'll be in the notes that get handed out. Right. So I propose, unless there's any objections, just to boot this up and let people see what it does. Right. Uh, so assuming it's still going to work, what I now do is I undo the... Uh, the projector thing from that, and I plug it in there. Uh, I now take the, oh sorry, let's, let's see what happens. Here's the Raspberry Pi. I plugged in two USB sockets for the keyboard and mouse, which uh, have come out of my bedroom, well out of my lab, even one with a broken F12 key. Uh, I've, got a HDM, I've got an HDMI connection which plugs into my television, uh, or it doesn't, well, uh, doesn't because I've got an old television. I've got a power supply here, which is just a micro USB one. Actually, it's my wife's Kindle lead and my iPhone charger. So uh, I really have built it out of the rubbish you'd have lying around. And I've now connected up the display, and we ought to power it on and see what happens. So I'll undo the laptop, and I'll power it on and see what happens. Nothing. Great. Uh, Oh, look, it's booting. So this is it sitting there booting Linux, and somebody's been keen on instrumenting how many seconds it takes to get going because we're sensitive about that. Uh, and it has now essentially booted, checking the file system and putting networks up and uh, doing all sorts of things that perhaps a bit more than one would wish. But uh, starting a it even starts an internet server so you can actually network, uh, read the time and uh, go out on the internet. I haven't connected the internet here. So there it gives me a straightforward login. If you want a terminal script, you can have that, but I'm just going to log in with the boring keys of Pi and Raspberry. Oh, one other good thing is it teaches children how to spell Raspberry. <laughs> uh, and so I've logged in, and I get a standard... Uh, desktop interface, but actually I'm just going to turn that in, sorry, not a desktop, a command line, but if I say start X, and this can clearly be just configured, it's now going to spend another 20 seconds booting me into a, uh, uh, an ordinary desktop image, and it's now going to populate these things down. So I can now, uh, I can now uh, do what can I do? Well, it's a real computer, so, um, sorry, I'm I can't do this from this angle. Um, uh, I can just start the thing up. One thing I can do is get to the internet and run a web browser. Um, and those of you, let me get the pointer. Along here, this is a little meter which shows how busy the CPU is. So obviously starting a big program like a web browser causes the thing to use a lot of CPU before it uh, gets up and uh, it's saying that uh, it can't find various things because uh, 
Uh, for example, the internet isn't stored. Oh, incidentally, you'll notice the time is wrong there. Uh, uh, that's because it doesn't have any uh, real-time clock on it. It normally asks on the internet what the time is. Um, what else can I do? Well, as I say, it's just a boring desktop computer. You see, I can go here and uh, uh, get myself uh, accessories, get myself a terminal. Terminal? Speak to me. Yes, lovely. Um, and you see, it is slightly slow. Some reason it's slow because it shouldn't be slow. Uh, apparently, we can run these memory cards twice as fast as we currently are doing. But there's a little um, control X plus. Uh, so there's a little desktop that I can, uh, I can run a Python program. I don't know Python. I can type Python, and it says this is Python, and I can say print uh, 1 plus 2. Um, and it very happily says I can't type straight. Uh, and I can now say 1 plus 2 again. And it says print's not defined because there's a caps lock. Yeah, I've got the ship here, 1 plus 2. And after a lot of messing about, it says 3. Isn't that good? Uh, I said you shouldn't code in C, but there's a program called foo.c here, uh, or hello.c. Um, right. And it says, hello world. I have cheated on that for various ways. And if you want to say, oh, what does it compile into? Uh, you can actually have a look and say cat uh, hello.s, which will show you the, oh, well, you can if I type. And there's the assembler code that it produces. So you can do this at many different levels. So I've showed you some weird, uh, some very strong and technical stuff. I've shown you uh, it running Python. Of course, I can say, well, what about Scratch? And I hope I've got Scratch on the desktop here. So let's shrink this and shrink this. I was rescued today because my, uh, my Raspberry Pi wasn't configured for the resolution of this uh, screen. So. Scratch may or may not, we'll, we will see. Anyway, so you see, it's, uh, right, so let me say again, it's just, it's just another computer for good or ill. Don't go away and say, it's really wonderful, we don't want it to overhyped, but if it gets people excited and changes mindset, it's a good thing. Equally, don't go out there and say, to program is all there is, it's the most fun you can have with your clothes on, Instead, say, programming is useful, but it teaches other skills on the way. The way of analyzing something and the way of, uh, the way of analyzing problems and constructing step-by-step -step solutions. And so I think I'll finish there. <laughs>